God is the God of fresh starts and second chances and new beginnings. If you're ready for a new beginning, then you're going to love the study of Joshua. That's where we find ourselves working our way through the story of Joshua. God gave Joshua and the children of Israel a second shot at the promised land, and they took it. And if you're interested in a second shot at your promised land, then Joshua's story is for you. Each week we begin the message with a declaration of glory days. The words are going to appear on the screen. Please sit up straight, put your head high, fill your lungs with air, and say this like you mean it. These days are glory days. My past is past. My future is bright. God's promises are true. And his word is sure. With God as my helper, I will be all he wants me to be, do all he wants me to do, and receive all he wants me to receive. These days are glory days. And may they be even more so, Father. May you awaken us from slumber. Stir within us the gifts that you have placed in our hearts to bring you glory. Through Christ we pray, and all God's people said, no one else is just like you. No one. No one else in all of history has your unique history. No one else in God's great design has your divine design. No one else shares your unique blend of personality, ability, and ancestry. When God made you, the angels stood back in silent awe and said to one another, we've never seen one like that before. And they never will again. You are heaven's first and final attempt at you. You are matchless, unequaled, unprecedented. Consequently, you can do something that no one else can do in a fashion no one else can. Don't you look at me in that tone of voice. (laughs) Yes, you can. You can do something that no one else can do in a fashion that no one else can. Others can manage a team, but not with your style. Others can cook a meal, but not with your flair. Others can teach kids, tell stories, aviate airplanes. You aren't the only one with your skill, but you are the only one with your version of your skill. You entered this world uniquely equipped. You were knit together not mass produced you were knit together woven together in the dark of the womb intricately and curiously wrought as if embroidered with various colors call it what you wish a talent a skill set a gift an anointing a divine spark an unction a call The terms are different, but the truth is the same. The Spirit has given each of us a special way of serving others. Each of us, not some of us, not a few of us, not the elite among us. Each of us has a special way, a facility, a natural strength an inclination, a tendency, a bent. Each of us has a beauty that longs to be revealed and released. An oak within the acorn pressing against the walls of the shell. This special way is slow to anchor. It is quick to sail. It is the duty for which you have been uniquely suited. This is your destiny. 
This is you at your best. When you stand at the intersection of your skill and God's call, you are standing at the intersection of Promised Land Avenue and Glory Days Boulevard. This is Canaan. And I'm going to belabor this point because I'm afraid you might miss it. Many people do. Many people settle for someone else's story. My dad was a butcher. My granddad was a butcher. I guess I'm going to be a butcher. Everyone I know is in farming. I grew up on a farm. I guess I'm supposed to farm. Many people never quarry the unique jewels that God placed within their souls. They never feel the fire in the belly. They never sing the song that God wrote for their voice. They never cross a finish line with heaven-stretched arms and declare, I was made to do this. They fit in. They settle in. They blend in, but they never find their call. Don't make the same mistake. It is God himself who has made us what we are and has given us new lives from Christ Jesus. And long ago, he planned that we should spend these lives in helping others. Your existence is not accidental and your skills are not incidental. God shaped each person in turn. There's no one else like you. Uniqueness is a big theme in the Bible. And this may surprise you, this is a big message in the book of Joshua. In fact, one could argue that the largest number of chapters in Joshua advance this command. Know your territory and possess it. This is our 14th lesson in our study of Joshua. 13 lessons are occupied with how Joshua and the children of Israel inherited their inheritance, how they moved out of the wilderness into the promised land. The rest of the book occupies itself with now that Joshua and his people have the land, what will they do with it? They've neutralized the enemy. They've eliminated the major seats of authority In chapter 12, there is a list of over 30 kings that they conquered. The land is taken. The rest of the book says, now that you have the land, take it, inhabit it, possess your possession. And so each of the 12 tribes is given a distinct territory and or assignment. Their inheritance was equal. But their assignments were unique. All the Hebrews inherited the promised land. All of the Hebrews entered into Canaan. The old, the young, the feeble, the forceful. The inheritance was universal, but the assignments were individual. These assignments are listed in detail in chapters 13 through 21. If you can't get to sleep one night, read those chapters. They're tedious. The book all of a sudden moves from an action novel to a land survey. And these pages make for dull reading unless, of course, you stand to inherit something. And since all the Israelites stood to inherit something, these pages were not boring to them. 
They stood alert as Joshua assigned the territory. Each tribe was called forward one at a time. Reuben, Gad, Manasseh. Each of the 12 tribes stepped forward. And each territory was different. Judah was given land that was large and central. Dan was given a smaller piece of property that was coastal. Even the assignments were unique. Did you notice that the tribe of Levi was not even given land? It was given an assignment. And God was the inheritance. And the people of Levi were to be worship leaders and Bible teachers. The big message of this big section of Scripture is everybody gets something. Nobody gets everything. But everyone gets something. Know your territory and possess it. Drive out the remaining enemies. Build your farms. Cultivate your fields. Find your lot in life and indwell it. Now, we might read this section of Scripture and say, well, that's 14 centuries before jesus christ what does this curious time of land distribution have to do with me in my life well joshua isn't the only commander to distribute territory our joshua jesus christ distributes gifts that are unique as well the apostle paul said it this way god has given each one of us, a special gift through the generosity of Christ. That is why the scriptures say, when he ascended to the heights, he led a crowd of captives and gave gifts to his people. The Apostle Paul is using a metaphor that his readers would have recognized as the picture of a victorious returning king. It was common in the days of the Apostle Paul for the conquering monarch to return to his castle with his prisoners and his treasures in tow. And he would celebrate his victory by distributing gifts to everyone in the kingdom. Jesus did the same. Our king in the heavenlies distributes gift, having, gifts. Having defeated sin and death on the cross, he ascended into heaven. He took his rightful place at the right hand of God. And what did he do? He looked over all of his people. Jesus, unbound by time or space, could see us all at one time. And he passed out gifts abilities and skills what a delightful thought jesus eternally crowned distributing abilities and skills just like joshua distributing the land remember that the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our lord and of his messiah and he will reign forever and ever promised land has been conquered and when we came to christ he led us across the jordan river and he is defeating our enemies through prayer and worship and understanding of scripture one by one those jerichos fall down and then he says now here's your gift Joshua said, tribe of Judah, take the high country. Benjamin, occupy the valleys. People of Gad, inhabit the land east of the Jordan. Jesus says, Joe, take your place in the domain of medicine. Mary, your territory is accounting. Susan, I give to you the gift of compassion. Now, Occupy your territory. Unpack your gift. Everybody gets a gift. Everybody. And these gifts come in different doses and combinations. Remember, every person or each person is given something to do that shows who God is. Our inheritance is grace-based and equal, but our assignments are tailor-made. 
No two snowflakes are the same. No two fingerprints are the same. Why would two skill sets be the same? No wonder the Apostle Paul says, make sure you understand what the master wants. And so really the question of the hour is, do you understand what your master wants? Do you know what makes you, you? Do you know what separates you from any other human being that has ever inhaled oxygen on this planet? You have an acreage, a portion to develop. So can I encourage you? You be you. There's a novel idea. You be you. Make a careful exploration of who you are and the work you have been given. Then sink yourself into that. You be you because there's no one else like you. Imagine a classroom of 25 kids on a given day in school. Ten of the 25 kids are struggling to stay awake. Ten others are alert, but they're ready to leave. But five students are not only awake and alert, but they're they're connecting. They get it. A couple of them don't even want the class to end. And they even do odd things like extra homework or tutoring. What class was that for you? If anyone ministers, look at this, let him do it as with the ability, emphasis mine, ability which God supplies. Your ability reveals your destiny. Your ability reveals your destiny. So what is your ability? What is that thing you do that causes you to say, oh, I want to do it again? What is that thing you do that causes other people to say to you, oh, do it again? What is that thing you do that causes other people to think? You make it look so easy. What is that thing you do that you find yourself returning to over and over and over again? What is that thing you do that you think, well, is it that hard? Everybody should be able to do this. No, they shouldn't. Because you're the only you we get. What is your ability? Your skill set is your roadmap to your destiny. Heed those longings, those skills within you. God loves you too much to give you a job without giving you the skills. Right? So, what are your skills? Follow those skills as your breadcrumbs to find your call. Identify your skills and unpack them. I think this should be a lifelong quest to do the most what we do the best. I especially think what we do for a living should conform to our design. You know, few situations in life are more miserable than a job misfit. Raise your hand if you've ever found yourself in a position of employment for which you were poorly suited and you knew it. Just about every one of us. Job misfits happen. They're a part of paying our dues. But I don't think they should happen for long. And they surely shouldn't happen for a lifetime. 
Yet for many people, they do. One study stated that only 13% of all workers find their work truly meaningful. Only 13% of people you see driving to work every day really have any sense of purpose in their work. No wonder those commuters look so grumpy. They don't want to go to work. If 9 out of 10 people don't want to go to work, imagine the impact this unhappiness has on a society, on a family, on health. If a person spends 40 hours or more a week plodding through a job they do not like or care about, what happens? I'll always appreciate my father for telling me, Max, just find something you like to do and do it so well people pay you to do it. It's the best employment advice I've ever heard. But I didn't always obey it. For 20 years, as you know, I was the senior minister of our church. I was in the thick of it all, the budgets, the personnel issues, the buildings, the hirings, even the occasional firings. And I was happy to fill the role, but you know what I really love to do is what I'm doing right now, preaching and and writing. And my mind, even in budget meetings, or maybe especially in budget meetings, was always gravitating toward sermon preparation, even during committee meetings. I was doodling on the next message. That worked for a while when the church was small, but as the church grew, so did our staff. And more staff meant more people to manage. More people to manage meant spending more and more time doing what I really didn't like to do. And I felt like I was gradually becoming one of the grumpy 87%. I was blessed to have options, blessed to have a church that provided flexibility, and extremely blessed to find Randy Frazee a senior minister with the skills to be a senior minister. What I didn't expect, however, were the number of people who came up to me afterwards expressing sympathy. More than one said, don't you miss being senior minister? Translation, didn't you get a demotion? Earlier in my life, I would have thought so. But I have come to see God's definition of a promotion. A promotion is not a move up a ladder. It is a move toward your call. If you're called to be a mechanic, be a mechanic. If you want to run the garage, you don't have to, but unless you're called to. You may be a great tuba player, but you may not be a great orchestra director. But if you're a great orchestra director, direct the orchestra. If not, be content to blast on the tuba. Look for ways to align your job with your skills. Now, I know this may take time. This may take several conversations with your boss. This may take a little trial and error, but I encourage you, don't give up. Promised land happens as you're doing the most what you do the best. Paul said, stir up the gift of God which is within you. So you be you. Don't be your parents. Don't be your grandparents. You can appreciate them. You can admire them. You can learn from them. But you can't be them. You aren't them. Don't compare yourself with others. Each of you must take responsibility for doing the creative best you can with your own Life. Jesus was insistent on this. After the resurrection, he appeared to some of the followers and he gave the apostle Peter a pastoral assignment that included great sacrifice. The apostle responded by pointing at John and saying, Lord, what about him? And Jesus said, if you want him to live, if I want him to live until I come back, that is not your business. Follow me. In other words, don't occupy yourself with another person's 
assignment. You just stay focused on your own. A little boy named Adam wanted to be like his friend Bobby. Adam loved the way Bobby walked and talked. Bobby, however, wanted to be like Charlie. Something about Charlie's stride and accent intrigued him. Charlie, on the other hand, was impressed with Danny. Charlie wanted to look and sound like Danny. Danny, of all things, had a hero as well, Adam. He wanted to be like Adam. So Adam was imitating Bobby, who was imitating Charlie, who was imitating Danny, who was imitating Adam. Turned out all Adam had to do was be himself. Stay in your own lane. Run your own race. Nothing good happens when we compare and compete. Celebrate others. Because you are not them and they are not you. And God does not judge you according to the talents of someone else. He judges you according to your own. And God's yardstick for measuring faithfulness is how faithful we are with our own gifts. You're not responsible for the nature of your gift. God determined that in advance, long before you were born. He knew what this generation would need, and he gave you the the ability to fulfill it. You didn't request your gift, but you can hone it. You can discover it. You can develop it. You can deploy it, and you are responsible for how you use it. Don't be like the Hebrew tribes. I wish I could report that each of the tribes moved quickly into their land, drove out the inhabitants, and put the acreage to good use. They didn't. In some cases, the tribes did not even drive out the enemies. The children of Israel did not drive out the Jeshurites or the Machathites. They did not drive out the Canaanites who dwelt in Gezer. They could not drive out the inhabitants. The Canaanites were determined to dwell in that land. They couldn't get the enemy out of their property. Listen, your enemy, the devil, is determined to occupy your property as well. It's not easy. It takes great resolve, but you must drive him out. You stay faithful to your call. Other tribes fell victim not to the Canaanites, but listen, to their own laziness. Long after Joshua had distributed the land, seven of the tribes were still in Gilgal, in the military camp. Joshua had to scold them. He said, how long will you neglect to go and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers is giving you? You weren't brought into the promised land, in other words, to stay in the military camp. How do we explain their indolence? I don't know. They, they marched out of the wilderness. They conquered the land. Yet when the time came to inherit their unique parcels, they grew lazy. Don't do the same. You are an heir with Christ of God's estate. And he has placed his spirit in your heart as a down payment And what God said to Joshua, he says to us, every place that the sole of your foot will tread, I have given to you. But you must possess it. You must deliberately receive what God so graciously gives. All that separates you from your promised land is your walk of faith. I encourage you to follow the example of American hero William Penn. Remember his story? He was befriended by some Native Americans who offered him a gift. He could have all the land he could walk around in one day. He took the offer at face value. He got up early the next morning. He walked briskly all day until dusk. When he returned, one of the chiefs allegedly said, The pale face has had a very long walk today. But they were pleased with his effort. And they honored their promise, and the land he encircled became the city of Philadelphia. God has given you a gift as well. Possess it. Inherit it. 
Find your lot in life and live in it. After all, you can do something no one else can do in a fashion no one else can do it. You be you. Amen? Amen. Lord, thank you for this remarkable plan that you have in which you give every single person a unique spiritual gift. Father, help us to find, develop, and deploy our spiritual skills. Teach us what that means, Lord. Through Christ we pray. And all God's people said, Amen.